All right, so we're on to topic 1.1, and this is going to be a topic point that's going to be exclusively what's going on in developments in East Asia from 1200 to 1450. So the essential questions that you'll need to answer for today is uh, these two here, okay? And when you answer these essential questions, you need to make sure that you're doing so in a manner that is going to be fully answering it. If you give me an answer such as um, they did a lot of things with government that would make it easier to rule. That is the most broad, generalized, and it doesn't really give me an example of what uh, is going on, and particularly in the Song Dynasty. So I've put together a helpful little rubric, I wouldn't call it a rubric, but a helpful guide of what a good answer is required and what score are usually associated with that, okay? And that's going to be found on Canvas. In this uh, assignment, you will find it highlighted in yellow. So make sure you take a look at that beforehand so you know exactly what my expectations are from you as distance learning and for now in-class learners of how you should answer the essential questions. So the first one is, to what extent did the developments of the Song Dynasty represent a continuation of the previous eras in Chinese history? Meaning, how are they similar to what's happened before in China already, and how is it a little different? And is it a high extent, low extent? Is it high extent because it's very, very similar, or is it a low extent because it's very different? So think about that. Make sure you answer that question. Is it high or low extent? Okay, that's all part of answering the question, the ATQ part of, of AP World History, okay? And the next one is also to what extent question is, to what extent did the Chinese civilization influence the surrounding civilizations of the East uh, and Southeast Asia? To a high extent, to a low extent, and then give me examples and explain why those examples show the answer, how they support your answer, okay? All right, so just like every video, I'd like to want to start off with some context. We talked briefly about this in Unit Zero uh, with uh, China, um, but the China had been ruled for a very long time um, by dynasties. And these dynasties, uh, they would rise and fall, and something we call the dynastic cycle. Now, the dynastic cycle usually is, you know, a dynasty comes around, a very strong dynasty comes on, it rules for a good long time period, uh, several hundred years at least in most cases. Um, and then uh, things start to get bad in China, natural disasters hit, so forth. Well, then when that happens, when things start to go bad, um, many of the people feel that the uh, rulers had lost what's called the mandate of heaven, the right to rule, you know, where they were put in this position of power. And when things start to go bad, then the people have this right to revolt. And so, you know, the people revolt against this old dynasty. Sometimes there's a period in between these dynasties where warring parties are trying to gain control and, you know, become the top family in that region or, you know, beyond. And then a new dynasty comes in and the whole cycle starts all over again. So it's a really an impressive like way of how we look at the Chinese uh, civilization. And for the Chinese, when they look at their civilization and their history, they measure their history in, in millennia and in centuries. We tend to look at it as, as centuries and decades. Um, we you know, look at the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s as being unique de decades. Uh, in American history, but when you look at Chinese history, they don't think of terms of decades, they think terms of millennia, they think of uh, centuries and so forth. Um, so the mandate of heaven, um, you know, is a big part of the um, Chinese dynastic rule. Um, and then something else to note is that the invention of woodblock printing came around in the seventh century. Um, this will lead to the widespread of ideas uh, throughout uh, East Asia um, centered around the Chinese civilization. So some little context, things are important to know what leads to what's going on in this period we're going to talk about today. So we're talking about the Chinese dynastic cycle. This is kind of an overview, brief overview of what it looks like on the timeline. We are going to be here to start off with, with the Song Dynasty, and they are going to rule from 960 to 1279. And we're going to be kind of starting roughly circa 1200. Um, some of the things that we'll talk about maybe go a little bit before, but this is about the area of uh, time that we are going to be starting out at. Okay. All right. So moving on. Not a good place for me to put here. So 
This is the red again, you know, if you watch the introduction video, and this is the language that's straight off of the curriculum um, of College Board. So a variety of internal and external factors contributed to state formation, expansion and decline. Government maintained order and through a variety of administrative institutions, policies and procedures and governments obtain, retain and exercise power in different ways and for different purposes. More specifically, what's going on here, the empires and states in Afro-Eurasia and the Americas demonstrated continuity, innovation, which innovation is kind of a key term for change, and diversity in the 13th century. This included the Song Dynasty of China, which utilized traditional methods of Confucianism and of an imperial bureaucracy to maintain the ju and justify its rule. So we're going to talk about this in a little more detail here, okay? So let's talk about the imperial bureaucracy. So imperial bureaucracy is, is a way that they were able to centralize their rule um, for each one of these dynasties. This is something that is like not a new concept during the Song Dynasty. It's, it goes back way before. Um, if we talked about the Han Dynasty, the Han Dynasty was extremely success, successful in creating this you know, massive bureaucracy where you have government officials who are highly trained uh, and um, highly specialized to be able to, to take control and uh, deal with matters that were important to maintaining a, a stable society within China. And so to kind of ensure that uh, they were putting the best people in place to do these very, very important jobs of, you know, that help maintain stability of society, they used to use these things called civil service exams. And, you know, these exams could take days to take. And you guys think it's bad doing the ACT and doing, um, you know, the college board uh, AP exams and such. Um, these exams went over the course of days and they determined your knowledge of uh, a lot of different things. In particular, they wanted to determine your knowledge of Confucian philosophy and, and belief system principles. Um, later on, you know, they also included other uh, information. You know, even the Song Dynasty, I believe, was the first one that was um, had uh, questions about uh, people's knowledge of uh, the Christian Bible, which Christianity uh, found its way into parts of China, um, too. So, you know, these are things that they needed to, to determine, you know, your base knowledge, your understanding. And so, you know, it, depending on your how well you did on that test, depending on whether or not you were going to be an important role inside this uh, bureaucracy. So in doing so, they've created this idea of a meritocracy. So this uh, principle in which, you know, the, the more trained and capable you are to do those jobs, the more likely you are going to do it. It was a different approach than you'll see in a lot of civilizations where they tend to use... Um, family members uh, as a means to put into positions of power, um, where China does have that to a lesser extent, they still relied very, very much on this idea of a meritocracy, putting the people who are the best for that job in that job. Uh, a major change that does occur during the Song Dynasty, even though the idea of the imperial bureaucracy and the civil service exams were continuations, major change was is that the Song, identity, Song Dynasty allowed for more opportunities for education for young men in those lower economic classes. And so, you know, in times before, you know, the people who could afford to send their kids to some sort of uh, education, um, I wouldn't say academy or school, but be able to bring in a tutor to teach and so forth, um, that was really usually afforded to them. The Song Dynasty tried to extend those opportunities for education and thus allowing the lower economics uh, classes to have this idea of upward social mobility. And um, so if you even if you grew up in, and born into a poor home um, of farmers and so forth, um, you still have the opportunity to, to try to um, get out of that and become part of this imperial bureaucracy. Um, by the end of the Song Dynasty, the bureaucracy had become so large and so expensive that it ends up draining a lot of the government's surplus wealth something that plays a role in the downfall of the Song Dynasty uh, during you know later time period. Okay. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is cultural developments. So straight from the curriculum, the development of ideas, beliefs, and religions illustrates how groups in societies view themselves and the interactions of societies and their beliefs 
often have political, social, and cultural implications. So there's your effect, cultural effects, right? Okay, the Chinese cultural traditions continued and they influenced neighboring regions. This is not a new concept, it's something that's happened before, but they continue to do it uh, in this time period as well. So one of the things that comes from China that is really important and has a great amount of influence on East Asia in general is this concept of filo piety. Um, and this is a Chinese tradition that comes straight from Confucianism. And it is the idea of how relationships are maintained and managed. Um, it is the idea of having this uh, virtuous respect for your elders. And so the relationship of how the a father and a son behave towards each other helps kind of maintain this societal order. Um, and so the there's lots of different layers to this, but you know, here's a kind of a basic understanding here at the bottom. Um, you know, how does the ruler behave towards the there's his subjects, his or her subjects? How does the subject behave towards his or her ruler? Um, father, how's a father treat his son? How's a son treat his father? Um, and so there are a lot of things we're not going to get to too much details, but it's just the idea of having this, you know, fortified role in society of how you're supposed to behave. This is a continuation um, going back to when Confucianism first came, um, you know, uh, circa, I, you know, not even uh, BC, but uh, many, many, many years ago, it became very popular during the Han Dynasty, which was about 200 to 480. Uh, I may have those numbers wrong. Okay. So um, Confucianism isn't the only major belief system that it finds itself into East Asia. One of the other ones is Buddhism. Now, Buddhism, if you all recall from uh, AP Geo or just regular core Geo, um, Buddhism starts in India. But um, even though it does become popular there for a short time, uh, in India, it does not stay in the long run, and it spreads by missionaries, by merchants, um, into other parts of East Asia, and it becomes very welcomed uh, by some of the people in East Asia, but not all. And um, when Buddhism arrives in the late Han Dynasty, um, the Han government uh, really treated it as a, uh, a threat to their way of life, um, because even though Buddhism and Confucianism, despite that, they do have some commonalities. Uh, you know, there is uh, enough of a differences that uh, the Han Dynasty um, and Confucian uh, scholars and and um, you know, people of that faith um, and that belief system saw as a threat early on. Um, and, and the reason for that is because Buddhism, you know, promotes this idea of getting rid of wealth. You know, trying to um, you know, find in, in, you know, internal peace in some sense, the idea of nirvana, whatever. And that kind of clashed against, you know, some of the goals of, uh, you know, Confucian society and, and Confucian order. Um, so that's, you know, it was treated hostile. But despite that, uh, there is a lot of people who really liked the spiritual stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm, I It's not a good way to describe it, but the, the spiritual elements of the, uh, of, of Buddhism and, and other religions like Taoism um, that were also in East Asia, um, which is something that the Confucian, you know, belief system didn't really um, fulfill for a lot of people. So over time, you start to see the Confucian, um, Confucian beliefs and the Buddhist and, and to a lesser extent, the, the, the Taoist uh, beliefs start to kind of intertwine a little bit. Um, and create a syncretic belief system, one known as Neo-Confucianism. This is just new Confucian, Confucianism, um, where it's largely still Confucius principles. Filia piety is something that's still very much a part of it, um, but they start to incorporate uh, aspects of uh, Buddhism to kind of fulfill that spiritual need for some people. And, um, you know, one way that they did that is you know, in Confucianism, it's very important for you to take care of your elders. Um, in Buddhism, it's kind of very important for you to take care of yourself um, and, and you know, try to find that internal peace and so forth. Um, so they kind of blend this idea, well, what can you do if you can give service to helping your elders? Does that not help give you peace as well? And so you got some blending of those two ideas. Um, and so Neo-Confucianism comes around during the Song Dynasty, 
Um, and that's kind of important to note. It is, it's a continuation of Confucius principles in general, but with the incorporation of some other belief systems, particularly Buddhism. Okay. Um, so a good example of that would be, you know, um, uh, Zon Mi, uh, who is um, a um, Confucian uh, philosopher. Um, he kind of viewed Confucius, the, the founder of Confucianism, Lao Tzu as the founder of uh, Taoism and Buddha as like the perfect sages. So each one of them are bringing something to the table that creates this kind of perfect belief system that can create balance in, in, the, in society and so forth. Um, so that's something that is going to um, play a role in shaping the culture of China, continue shaping the culture of China um, even to today. Confucian principles and traditions do continue, and some of them, um, you know, become more apparent in their society. There's always been this idea of patriarchy, and for those who can't remember, patriarchy is where men tend to be kind of in charge in society. And when we kind of go back to feel of piety, um, there is a specific, you know, relationship between the husband and the wife um, and how they behave towards each other. Um, and it's kind of expected the wife has obeyed the husband in some way. Well, you know, over time, you know, that's, you see a lot of traditions and culture and so forth uh, reflect that patriarchy. And one of those examples is the foot binding. Now, some of you may be looking away from the screen or just so horrified about what you're seeing in terms of the picture. But this was something that was practiced in China um, from the Song Dynasty circa 900 AD to 1912. Um, it's even some people who are a much older generation still have their foot um, bounded. Um, it's a tradition that has pretty much been outlawed by the Chinese government. Um, it's no longer around um, and allowed, um, but it is something that happened. And what would happen, they would do is when these girls were very young, they would start bandaging their foot to kind of make them so they wouldn't be able to grow. It kind of breaks the growth plate. Um, and then so they have these very, very small feet. On the Canvas page with this assignment, I've just linked a video. It's about two, three minutes long, and it kind of talks about a little bit more about foot binding if you're more interested in kind of this whole system, how they did. But it's a great example of patriarchy that continues in China during the Song Dynasty. Um, and so even though this is a newer practice, it does reflect those patriarchal um, you know, values. Okay. So we're moving on to a little bit of how the Chinese uh, influenced the regions uh, around them or the, the civilizations around them in, in East Asia. Um, Japan and Korea being the, the big ones that we are going to note, and they have a large amount of influence on them. Even though there are two distinct people and cultures, you can't deny that there is a lot of um, cultural similarities there that kind of transcend each one of them. It's almost like when you look at Europe. Um, Europe has lots of different cultures and so forth, but they also have a lot of similarities to each other as well. Um, so the Japanese... Um, you know, they adopt a lot of the, the, the ideas and the concepts of the Chinese writing, um, end up creating um, their own writing system, Heian, um, during the Heian period. Um, and they named it after what their capital was, uh, which was currently now called Kyoto. Um, but it was the period at that time, it was Heian, and it's, yeah, that was their capital. Um, they learned woodblock printing from the Chinese. Um, they borrowed much of the writing. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, and this, you know, a lot of the um, sounds that uh, were used in Chinese characters didn't necessarily match the, the sounds of the Japanese language. So they created their own writing called Kana writing. Um, and you know, from there, they, they created their own literature, their own sense of, of cultural identity at the same time. Um, you know, one of the world's, world's first novel, um, The Tale of Ken, Genji, um, was written by a Japanese writer in, in Kana writing. Um, so that's something that is important to note as an example of even though they were influenced by China, they also have their own cultural identity at the same time. The same thing with the Koreans. You know, the Koreans, um, they have a Chinese, uh, they were influenced by the Chinese writing system, um, and they developed their own uh, writing, say, Hangul. Uh, in the 15th century, 
Um, and it's said to be King Sejon, uh, who was uh, one of the dynastic rulers of Korea. Um, he was the one to help create and facilitate the first Korean alphabet, um, one that is still used in Korea today. Um, they adopted many other cultural traditions from the the Chinese as well. The, the you know, Buddhism and Confucianism, uh, very much part of uh, Korean culture even to today. Um, Korea also was um, um, took the idea of using civil service exams and a meritocracy to help um, create this uh, very uh, successful bureaucracy and such. Um, the big difference, though, is that peasants were not allowed, like they were in the Song Dynasty, to be able to become part of it. It was an exclusive um, position for the wealthy in there. Um, King Sejong, uh, an important part of uh, Korean history, even so much so, if you look at the um, Korean money, um, most of their, the people on their money, like here in the United States, we use presidents and founders and so forth. Um, but they used Confucian scholars, um, and, and one of the most important Confucian scholars and, and ruler was King Sejong, which is why he's at the 10,000, I don't know what their currency is called now that I think about it. So, so Japanese writing, Korean alphabet, um, you know, you can see there's a lot of similarities in how it looks. There's obviously a lot of distinction for those who are more trained eye. Um, but there's a lot of influence by the Chinese writing. And so that is one way in which the Chinese continue to influence the, the regions outside of their own. Okay. Buddhism and going on to Buddhism, Buddhism and its core beliefs continue to shape the societies of Asia, including a variety of branches, school and practices. So when I talked about the beginning, Buddhism starts in India and then breaks into different parts, you know, as they arrive into different regions, you know, like, there is a pushback because here we have this this idea that's very radical compared to the the cultural and, and religious beliefs of that region and it takes some time it's not just automatically adopted it takes some time for them to like hey i like these ideas but then i also like these ideas and then so over time you start to see blending and changing and you get some distinct branches of buddhism um, around the world. And so here are the three distinct branches of Buddhism. We're going to talk a little more detail here in a bit. Um, Theravada um, is the branch of Buddhism that you will find mostly in Southeast Asia. Um, and you can see it on the map here. Um, this is the one, it mainly focuses, it's, it's, it's one considered the one of the more traditional ones. It focuses mainly on individual growth, personal growth, trying to um, get rid of things that cause suffering. Um, and again, if you don't remember Buddhism from EP Geo or Core Geo, I've, I've linked a little five minute video, of basic overview of Buddhism. You should and ought to know a little bit about that in your background knowledge. Um, but they focus a lot on silent meditation, self-discipline. Um, and that is, you know, where you'll find uh, Theravada Buddhism uh, in the world today, primarily. It's not the only place, but this is where they tend to uh, have the largest concentration of, of um, Theravada Buddhists. Okay, Mahayana um, Buddhism is another branch that came, became very popular as it spread by merchants along the Silk Road and then eventually slowly kind of spread into China. Um, and this is a type of uh, Buddhism that really kind of focuses mainly on spiritual growth. And that um, it's not just about individualism in your individual path to enlightenment. Um, there's a belief that um, you have this uh, obligation to not only help yourself get to um, you know, a total state of enlightenment, um, but also to help others. And so you, know, you can do that through service, um, helping the elders um, and other things uh, that uh, kind of were beneficial to society. Um, and so I like that blending of some Confucius principles in there as well, right? All right. And then there's also Tibetan. And, and Tibetan Buddhism um, is another form of Mary, uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Um, it uh, emerged in the Tibetan Empire between 7th and 9th century, uh, where kind of uh, it's now part of China, Tibet. Um, it's like the southeast part of, uh, sorry, southwest part of China. Um, and so they are known, this is probably one of the more popular um, 
known in forms or branches of Buddhism here in the West. Um, that's because they have uh, a clear, distinct leader, and that's the Dalai Lama. Um, the Dalai Lama's, uh, the current one, is um, in exile because when China took control of Tibet, um, you know, the Chinese government uh, is, um, I want to say anti-religion, but they are, they do not like belief systems that clash with government control, okay? Um, and so because of that, um, you know, many of the um, Buddhist monks from uh, Tibet uh, flee, including the Dalai Lama, um, and he lives um, primarily in India, but he travels the world at the same time. He's believed in this you know, branch of religion to be the reincarnation of, of the Buddha. Um, and they have a very interesting system of how they determine, you know, who is the true um, Dalai Lama. Um, and he's become older, so it's very interesting what will happen um, to the, the Dalai Lamas and, and Tibetan Buddhism if he does pass away, is con considering that um, yeah, their, the ancestral homeland is, is um, now generally occupied by China. But uh, Tibetan Buddhism saw its biggest uh, influence during the Yuan Dynasty when the, the Mongols take control of, of Tibet. Um, and the Mongols were uh, very religiously tolerant, despite a lot of the other things that come with them. They were a very religiously tolerant country uh, or uh, peoples. And so their ideas spread um, as they uh, also promoted trade and so forth. Okay, so that's kind of where they break down here. Um, Tibetan uh, is the orange. Um, Theravada is the red, and then Mahayana is in the yellow. Um, you can see China, Korea, Japan, um, Vietnam, you know, generally are all the Mahayana uh, Buddhism. And that's a lot of influence from China, of course. Okay, so the economy of the San China became increasingly commercialized while continuing to depend on free peasant and artisanal, artisanal labor. So this is something that, you know, big change, more in commercialization, more production, and they continue to use free peasant and artisanal labor as, as a means to do that. So during the Song Dynasty, we started to see this shift towards proto-industrialization. And so it's not full industrialization, but it's kind of like heading towards that. And this is the first country in the world that's doing this. You know, the Europeans will eventually do this um, after the discovery of, of the Americas. But this type of industrialization where you have people are primarily still farmers. Um, the need to grow food and eat is still the top priority economic activity. However, um, you know, there's the times where, you know, harvesting is and planting are not needed. So you needed a way to supplement your income. So people began to take on different traits and learn different skills. Um, and then so, you know, doing things like making um, iron tools or something and then taking them into selling them in the market and so forth. Um, you start to see that kind of incorporation. And so the manufacturing of China increases significantly during the Song Dynasty. Um, the artisan, art, artisans are going to produce more steel. Um, they're going to, um, you know, be, how do I put this? Um, they're just going to produce a lot more manufactured goods and items that want to be um, sold um, across the trade networks that they kind of linked into, right? Um, you know, they were the biggest producers of steel in the world. The, the government, the Song Dynasty government had, you know, control over the, all the smelters. Um, and so they, you know, pushed more construction of steel all over. Um, you know, during this time, the population of the you know, Song of China is going to increase significantly. We'll talk about that, reasons why that is here a little bit more. Um, you know, and that increases production. And so there's you know, more people, more workers, more goods to be bought and sold. Um, so they're making this shift uh, in society. Now, the Song Dynasty, you know, benefits from this because as they produce more and, and, and sell more and trade more and such, they're there to collect taxes. And by collecting taxes, they could help create and, and put money towards these major public works projects to help increase uh, the movement. So building roads, building uh, canals, which we'll talk about here in a bit more so. Um, you know, circulating more money into the, um, the economy, this is all possible because of this. So it's this kind of domino effect and China becomes really one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful civilization economy in the world at this time. 
So steel and iron production increases. Um, textiles and porcelains are created more so for export. This, of course, is silk, which is something that has been happening already. It's a continuation, but production is increasing. So, you know, more is being sold across uh, the trade networks like the silk roads. Uh, porcelain is something when the Europeans arrived, this is something that was highly in demand um, by, by the Europeans. And so they, you know, increase production because of that when they do arrive. Um, but that's not for a while yet, okay? So the economy um, is of South China flourish as a result of increased product uh, productive capac capacity, <laughs> expanding trade networks and innovations in agriculture and manufacturing, okay? So we're gonna focus on this one thing, the innovations in agriculture and manufacturing. One of the things that really ought to be important to note, um, and I've linked another video to this about um, this illustrative example of champa rice. So champa rice is something that comes to China um, via the tribute system. You know, during you know, times of the Chinese dynastic rule, um, they did not go and invade other countries uh, and other civilizations. I mean, they did, but they didn't do them all um, because they basically kind of made them tributary states. And so seeing how the Chinese saw themselves as kind of the center of the universe, this is something that is still a kind of uh, around today, is that, you know, if they are going to be allowed to have a certain amount of sovereignty, they need to pay tribute to the, the emperors. And so they, you know, these, the Japanese, the Koreans, you know, pay tribute to the, uh, the Chinese and uh, even the Champas, which is, you know, a civilization that's where we find modern day Vietnam. Well, champa rice was something that came from there, and this is very fast-growing, fast-maturing rice that uh, would be able to grow in, in you know, drought years as well. And so this continuous production of rice uh, allowed for them to be able to feed uh, more people in, the, in China. And so as a result, you saw a huge increase in population uh, during the Song Dynasty because of the introduction of of not just chopper rice, but also new uh, agricultural practices, such as building a more irrigation systems that were built by the Song Dynasty from those taxes. Remember, we're talking about public works, building more irrigation systems and use of terrace farming. And that's where you have the system where you, you, know, you can now um, grow stuff and, and farm in, in more mountainous and hill regions. So you just kind of take the, well, let me see this. Uh, mountain, you kind of cut into steps into the side of the mountain, um, and that and it helped increase production. You can see here on this population chart, you know, the, the, here's the um, you know, Chinese population. It's very steadily just kind of increase, decrease, whatever. Now, here comes the Song Dynasty. Whoa, bam. This is a huge increase. It may not look like it when you compare it to here, um, but this is a pretty big increase uh, when you compare it to the past dynasties. And the reason for that is the Champa rice. Uh, it's not the only one, but it is a major one. Um, and then it goes back down here and the Yuan dynasty. And that, there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that another time. Um, but that is something important to note that the massively increases the population of China because of the introduction of Champa rice. Um, as Ben Freeman will say in the video I've linked to you, it's probably China's greatest gift that they have ever received. So, the other things that helped increase production and, and help uh, increase uh, commercialization of China was the um, transportation innovations like the Grand Canal. So the Grand Canal was built during the Sui Dynasty, um, and that was something that um, kind of ends up to the downfall of that dynasty because they uh, you know, required tribute and, and people to pay taxes of formal labor, um, and they built this canal and you know thousands and thousands of people died. Um, because of the work conditions in this. But what this does, it ends up kind of, um, not kind of, it does it make the, um, the Chinese civilization more connected um, from South and North China. Um, the canal itself connected these two major rivers. Uh, and now you can see that there was more production of goods um, the north um, would help produce more food that can feed the south, and the south could produce more manufactured goods that are sent to the north. And so this was something that helped increase China's population, too, at the same time, as well as its commercialization overall. So those are some things that occur in China as a result of 
um, the the Grand Canal and other public works projects. But this one, if you know this one, this is the one to know as far as um, you know innovations in China that helped increase commercial production. Right. All right. So we come back to our essential questions one more time. Um, make sure you answer these either on a Google Doc and, and upload them, or you could do it as a text entry. But take some time. Make sure you write down some good responses. Um, make sure you're using strong examples and explain why those examples help support your answer. Um, so those are things that I look for uh, in your responses. Um, this is uh, something that will be due. Um, check the due date on the assignment for where you'll find this video. Um, but otherwise, this is what you are expected to work on. And that is it for me, I think. So I will see you all next class period uh, and uh, we will be talking about 1.2.